Thank you, BIC. Thank you for the audience who turned up, braving Bangalore's challenges. What I'm going to do is basically tell you stories going back to at least personal experience, 1985, but in terms of conservation history, a few centuries. I'm going to focus on the Asiatic lines because that's what I've tried to spend my life studying and advocating for. And then there's been a curveball thrown at all of us with these cheetahs coming from Africa. I will try and convey in jargon-free language what this means, what the implications are, and what as citizens of this country we could and should be doing. Very often images that we get of our lines from Gir show them by the road or with tourists. So I'm going to take you on a quick pictorial tour to show you the wonderful ways in which these animals exist, the habitat, the kind of interactions they have with people, and why I consider them really special as a population of lions. Lions are, of course, very special in other ways. They are the only cat which is social which means they normally live in groups. And also, it's also the only cat which is sexually dimorphic. Even from a distance, you can make out an adult male from an adult female. There are some distinct morphological or anatomical characteristics by which you can roughly identify an Asiatic line from an African line. For instance, this fold of skin, which is called a belly fold, that's universal in Asiatic lions. It's complicated by the fact that about 50% of African lions also have a belly fold. So the absence of a belly fold is diagnostic for African lions. The presence is not diagnostic for either African or Asiatic. The other commonly stated feature is the top of the head. In all Asiatic lions, you can see the ears. There's a good percentage of African lions who have extremely copious mane, like a haystack, and you can't see the ears. So if you can't see the ears in a male lion, that's African. But if you see the ears, you don't know whether it's African or Asian. These are also lions who live in forest. If you've been brought up on a diet of National Geographic and all the Animal Planet and those kind of channels, most of the imagery there is lions from open habitats, savanna habitats. And normally it's from Serengeti, um, Masai Mara and places like that. Lions have lived and continue to live across a very wide range of habitats. In Africa, for instance, they were found extreme south, Cape of Good Hope, all the way through to Atlas Mountains through Kalahari Desert, to the rainforests of Western Central Africa, through Sahara Desert. So if anybody tells that lions are found only in some kind of habitat, they don't know what they're talking about. And similarly, lions through a process of natural dispersal move through Far East, well into India, as I will show you in a minute. And here is the female. So you can clearly make out the male and the female. and a female with her cubs. This, of course, you see a male, a female, and a couple of cubs, a very rare kind of sighting in gear. Very seldom are males seen associating with females with cubs or larger groups. You, of course, will see them when they are mating with a female. It's unusual compared to the African situation, at least from the Serengeti system, which is the well-studied system. 95% of sightings there will have adult males and adult females together. More or less, the converse is true in gear. Very seldom do you see adult males associating with adult females or larger groups unless they are mating. And this is the social unit, the pride. The pride doesn't really contain males. The pride is a bunch of related females, multiple generations, who stay in a particular patch of land, their territory, which they defend, uh, from other prides. Males live in groups ranging from two to seven. Seven is very unusual. I, I studied a male coalition of about five. And larger coalitions don't need to always stay together. 
Sometimes they will be found in two, sometimes they will be found single. But when you study them over a long period of time, you get to know that they are part of the same coalition. Actually, the same thing holds true for tribes also. Very seldom would you see such large groups. You'll see them in twos and threes and fives. And occasionally you'll see them as 12 and 15 and so on. And whenever females start giving birth to cubs, the pride size will dramatically go up. And most females coordinate their cycling so that cubs are all born within a few weeks. A pair of males sleeping. I mean, this is typically only in India under a banyan tree. And this is a three male coalition out of, uh, I mean, three of a five male coalition I studied. Now, over history, as in the last two centuries at least, lions have been divided into multiple subspecies. But with recent tools like genetics, it's been clearly established that there are only two subspecies of lions, the northern subspecies and the southern subspecies. So you can see that the lions are primarily in Africa and you see that last remnant population of Asiatic lions in Gir Forest, Saurashtra Peninsula, Gujarat. The lions, the northern lions, occur in West Africa, Central Africa and now in India. The southern lions are in East Africa and Southern Africa. So what used to be called Panthera leo persica, the Asiatic lion, is now Panthera leo leo. And the other subspecies is Panthera leo melanocyta. So this is your former distribution reconstructed from hunting records. You can see that the lines from, this is Africa, this is the Red Sea, through a process of natural dispersal came all the way as far east as Bihar and as far south as Narmada. In the last few weeks, uh, somebody has done wonderful research to establish the fact that actually these boundaries are even wider. There are now records of lions having occurred in India south of the Narmada and east of Bihar. I'm still to get hold of the paper and then I'll try and update this map. But it gives you a good sense of what the distribution of the lions were in India. What is today Palam Airport was lion habitat. People, uh, soldiers from Red Fort on, rode on horseback and shot lions in Palam. Um, so many of our modern day states, Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, uh, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Uttar, parts of Uttar Pradesh and as far east as Jharkhand and Bihar used to have uh, lions. And the only reason they are restricted to gear is us. The advent of the firearm just gave enormous technological prowess to people. They could go and shoot these animals. And the advantage tigers and leopards had over lions was that they don't exist in groups. They are not a social animal. So if you even shot a tiger, at best you could shoot one unless it's a mother with cubs. And the same thing holds for leopard. The other thing is lions live in much more open habitat when compared to tigers and leopards. They can't keep their mouth shut. I mean, they roar regularly. So if you don't see them, you hear them. So they just made themselves much more easy to be located and shot. So you have this kind of distribution in the early 1800s. And by 1888, the last line outside of Saurashtra is shot. So in a matter of something like eight to nine decades, um, human beings did this to nature. So as you can see, the lions very nearly went extinct, um, less than 12, less than 20. Don't, don't pay too much attention to the accuracy of these numbers. It's just the scale that we need to worry about. And you can see that there has been a recovery. Uh, again, as I said, don't pay too much attention to that. But in general, the trajectory is going up. And here a much more recent update. The most recent census was two years ago in 2020. Here. Now this graph has another axis to it, which are the yellow colored bars, which tells you the area over which the lines are found. And you can see that today, lines are found in something like 30,000 square kilometers. Uh, the number on the chart, which is given by the government is 674, but let's work with 700. It's an easier number to remember and work with. And about 50% of those lines are not found within the sanctuary. They found on roads, railway stations, harbors, agricultural fields, peanut go downs, uh, your backyard, you know, that's where the lines are. 
This is a map of the protected area. All put together, there are three or four administrative units. All put together, you have about 1,600 and odd square kilometers. Lines are found over 30,000 square kilometers. You can do the math and find out how bulk of the area over which line is uh, currently found is human dominated, human modified habitats. Rural landscape, towns, and even large cities like Jonagar. Uh, it doesn't take much of uh, searching on the internet to find these incredible videos of lions getting into people's houses, onto roofs, lions eating cattle on the main road, people walking by, cars driving by, uh, lions charging through people who have come to see it. Uh, you know, it's amazing that so few people get injured, attacked or killed given the frequency of interaction. I would think a few hundred interactions are taking place every day outside the forest. Inside the forest is another story. Outside the forest in human dominated habitats, at least a few hundred individual interactions are taking place between lions and people. Bless the lion that they are not attacking us more. The central part, the dark green has the status of a national park. In India, our dominating piece of legislation for wildlife conservation is called the Wildlife Protection Act enacted in 1972. Actually, this month marks the 50th anniversary of the enactment of the Wildlife Protection Act. So under this act, you have various types of protected areas and the strictest of that is the national park. So within a national park, there can be no human activity, but for climate change, of course. And surrounding that, you have uh, uh, the national park is about 250 square kilometers. The surrounding area has the status of a wildlife sanctuary, and that's about 1200 square kilometers. You can see roads going through that, there are railway tracks going through that, there are reservoirs, human-made reservoirs inside that, and seven perennial rivers uh, drain this habitat. You can also see that the protected area doesn't have an ideal shape of a protected area. It's extremely irregular. The boundaries in that sense have increased the interface between human habitation and wildlife habitat. There are chicken necks, narrow uh, strips of protected area, jutting into human dominated habitats, all of which is not ideal because the line doesn't recognize these boundaries. If it wants to go from place A to place B, it's going to choose the shortest distance to go through, especially at night. So it, it in that sense, throws up uh, its own challenges. To give you a quick view of what the forest looks like, dry deciduous forest, and in the extreme east, it's really dry, open, savanna kind of Africa-like habitat. One of the perennial rivers, the Hiran, uh, which also flows by the park headquarters, Sasangir. Monsoon is a major driver of ecology of this place. And you can see how the habitat was earlier. And in a matter of days, uh, it gets painted green. Because that's the only time that this area gets rain. All the plant growth has to take place in those three or four months, if the monsoon is good. It's a drought prone area. As I said, these are forest dwelling animals. And lions are not the only cats found in gear. There's a leopard in the tree, if you can find it. Leopards are able to live in high densities with lions, tigers, simply because of their ability to live arboreally. They can just escape anything by moving up. Not just moving themselves up, also moving their kills up, so that it doesn't get scavenged upon by the larger cat. Not only leopards, there are people, the Maldaris, the local graziers. Uh, in those days, at least, they used to use camels as their mode of transport and the, the occasional horse. Nowadays, it's motorbikes. And they graze primarily buffaloes. And they live in these thorn enclosed settlements called Nessus. Extremely hardworking, very hospitable people. Uh, this is a photograph taken something like 4 a.m. They're churning uh, curds to turn into uh, butter, then which will be uh, used to make ghee. Ghee, at least in those days, was their product of commerce. They'll take it to the market and barter it for things that they need. Nowadays, refrigerated trucks are coming in. They're taking liquid milk to the local dairy. So their economic status is also improving. Lions are carnivores. They will have to eat meat. And typically, a lion pride will hunt something like once in three or four days, maximum five days. Uh, but it's not as if they can set a timetable for this. No prey animal is sitting and waiting to be hunted. Uh, typical success rate in hunting is about 20%, which is one in five hunts. 
Hunt is an extremely energy intensive behavior. It's prone with risks. Prey animals have hooves, have horns, have antlers. They can kick, they can, you know, do all kinds of things to break a bone. And a line with a broken bone is as good as a dead line. I mean, there's no hospital, there's nothing that will help it recover. Just some photographs to close up to tell you how a line eats. That's a cheetal. That's a group of lines, a pride of lines feeding. If you look carefully, you can see a cheetal leg sticking out there. And lions are very proficient predators. Lions have a very bad public image, at least the time I started in the 80s. They were called lazy animals. I mean, tigers are the only true wild animal. Lions are not so wild and so on and so forth. Here is an adult female who weighed about 110 kilograms. I know that because I weighed her. And she has brought down an adult Nilgai on her own. And that Nilgai would have weighed nothing less than 300 kilograms. Nilgai is the largest antelope found in Asia. And the male is so much bigger than the female. But lions also hunt livestock. It's easier to hunt, much higher return per hunt effort. So that's a buffalo they are feeding on. A pair of mating lions. Mating is an extremely loud, raucous activity. Uh, since males live in coalitions, uh, one male has to take the lead. Often there is a dominant male. But if he leaves the female alone, other males are going to sneak in and steal her away from him. So the female is also kind of tense. So it takes a day or two for them to settle down. And then, you know, when you see this kind of behavior, I, I, as I told you earlier, you don't see males and females together in gear that often. But when you see this kind of behavior, you, you're more or less assured that that's a mating pair. Mating can last anything from four to about seven days. The first day, day and a half is like dating, getting to know you each other. And then the action starts. And then the last day is kind of taking rest. The risk the female runs, look at the size difference. The male is on top of her. If he decides to clamp his jaws on her neck, she's dead. So which is why as soon as the deed is done, she will turn back and growl at him and even hit him on his face. Very often at the end of five, six days, the male's face is all scarred and bloody. This is not from a mating thing, this is from another fight. Males will carry a lot of injuries. Male's job is to defend, to patrol. And that's very different from the female's job. So males move. Typically, they will move three to five kilometers overnight. Sometimes they can move 30 kilometers overnight. And since there are such a good network of roads, lions tend to use man-made paths because they're free of vegetation, thorns, the soft sand. It also helps people like me to go out and track and find them. And what are they defending? basically females, to be able to mate with them, to pass their genes on to the next generation. When a coalition loses territory, they lose access to the females. The next coalition that comes in, if it finds young cubs of this age, they will kill them. Simply because their genes are not carried by the cubs. They don't want to invest time and energy defending these cubs. And when females are lactating with such young cubs, they are not going to come into estrus to allow for mating. And the tenure of males in a, co in a pride is limited, three to five years. So they want to maximize the time to bring two, three lots of cubs. So that's, that's the way nature has evolved. That's it. Dr. AJT Johnson, India's first fully trained wildlife biologist. And that's me, much younger version, 1987 with one of our uh, radio collared animals. We did the first uh, radio collaring study of uh, lions in India. That's me with my field crew and my colleague, Dr. Jamal Khan, who's now teaching at Aligarh Muslim University. This is the female who killed the Neil guys. That's how I know her weight. Once you put radio collars out, it's a good recipe for exercise. I mean, you have to climb hills all the time to get signals to find out where these animals are. Without a radio collar, you can always say, I didn't find a line. But with radio collars, the, the onus is on you. These signals are transmitting all the time. In a good situation, you can get it as far as seven kilometers. But very often, you're working with a range of between two and five kilometers. And if you go up at a high point, your range increases. The signals are directional. The antenna is directional. So if you get a strong signal from that direction, you go towards that. You use a compass, move forward. So you do a 360-degree sweep to find out where the signal is coming from. 
As I said, lions today live a lot outside the forest. This is a map to give you a sense of how far they are spread. So this is Gir and they have not yet reached uh, Burda, but all the other places that are here and the insects, the uh, magnified maps, lions are all over the place. So you see this from 2015 census. You can find out the numbers of lions outside. Today, the 2020 data tells us that almost 50% of the lions are found outside and not inside. And the rate of growth of population inside the park is very low. Bulk of the growth is taking place outside, simply because there is no real estate left to be occupied within the protected area. And this is what happens. A pair of villages, probably they don't even know a lion is resting. It's outside the forest. And this is within the forest, a lion crossing a railway line, but this happens much more outside. They do get killed occasionally, uh, almost every year, uh, knocked on by trains, by buses, they fall into open wells, they get electrocuted, all kinds of things, Tamasha happens. The question that I want all of you to ponder about, think about is, what is conservation? Is it about saving every single animal? Is it about saving populations? Or is it about ensuring populations persist, not over a year or two, but over multiple decades? And not just animal populations, but functional ecosystems. Because for lions to live, it needs vegetation, it needs prey, it needs water, it needs a whole lot of things happening. Vultures, everything needs to be there in place. And that's what we call a functional ecosystem. Or is it only about real estate? I mean, we protect the habitats, the animals will take care of them. Or connectivity between habitats, because human beings have just taken up so much of space that today if a lion wants to move from one place to a larger place, it has to traverse through roads, railway tracks, and other human-dominated habitats. As I said, what time frames do we work with? Typically, conservation projects cannot aim for anything less than five years, but ideally in the 20 to 50 year time frame is a good time frame to plan. What about rights of people? India is a nation of what, 1.3, 1.4 billion people? Most of them, a vast majority of them are land-based agriculture, biomass-based economies competing in some sense with nature or at least with wildlife as we see it. And let's not forget India today has a legislation from 2006 called the Forest Rights Act, which gives them rights. So nobody is doing them a favor by giving them these rights. What about justice? What about inclusive approaches? I mean, you have a national park which says throw people out. Is that correct? Would you like somebody coming and telling you, we want your house, will you please move out? How, how does that feel? Who bears the costs of conservation? And who, bears the, who reaps the benefits? These are questions that we seldom ask, especially amongst urban population. But urban population is what dictates how conservation policy are framed and how conservation is implemented in this country. While lions have recovered spectacularly, we also have challenges. This is from 2020, if I remember correctly, yes. In the first five months, 92 lions have died. Lions dying or anyone dying is not great news. I mean, we're all born to die at one level. It's the cause of death, the timing of death, the circumstances of death that we need to think about. The problem here is in two months, 60 animals have died. There's a good evidence of diseases taking place. That's what makes us worry. So you saw the charts, lions down to 20, but now lions up to 700 but they're all in gear and surrounding gear. It's like having all your eggs in one basket. And my PhD work was to find ecological information, updated ecological information. I did that in 85 to 90, a long time ago, and then use that information to inform what is called as a translocation or a reintroduction, setting up a second and a third free-ranging population of lions. So I will take you through that story. So in 94 and 95, we went out, 93 and 94, we went out and surveyed. We found this place called Kuno, named after the river Kuno, which is a major uh, tributary of the Chambal. This is northwestern Madhya Pradesh bordering Rajasthan. Beautiful place, but at that point of time had its conservation challenges. Just to give you a sense of what the landscape looks like there. Very diverse habitats, very rich habitat. And you can see grasslands, patches of it but you also had overgrazing and all the associated problems with it. So I did this work 
gave my recommendations to the government on 25th January 1995. Remember this distinctly. The Secretary to the Government of India, the Chief Wildlife Warden of Gujarat, the Chief Wildlife Warden of Madhya Pradesh, a senior colleague from the Wildlife Institute were in this room. Everybody accepted what was told. And Government of India from April of 1995 has been funding and preparing Kuno to play home to the Lions. That was 95. Sometime in 2006, a public spirited citizen went to the court, Supreme Court that is, and said, so many families have been moved out, so many crores of rupees has been spent. It was all to translocate lines. Why haven't lines been moved? The case wound its way through the courts. In 2012, I got a call to serve as an expert advisor to the court. So this is about that and subsequent developments. The judgment came on 15th of April 2013 and it was unequivocal. It ordered the translocation of lines from Gir to Kuno in letter and spirit within six months, which would have been 14th of October 2013. 14th of October 22 is not that far away, nine years, and there is still no sign of the lines moving. And that gets my goat. It should get all of your goat, but it definitely gets my goat. There is text to give you a sense of what the judgment is. I'm happy to share the judgment. It's freely available online. It's a fairly erudite judgment. It talks about ecological principles and how we need to adopt an ecocentric approach to life in this country and not an anthropocentric approach. It, it refers to specific clauses of uh, provisions of the constitution. It extols the role of the National Board for Wildlife and of the National Wildlife Action Plan. So just focus on these texts. No state, organization or person can claim ownership or possession over wild animals in the forest. I mean, this is in the judgment, verbatim quote. Animals in the wild are properties of the nation for which no state can claim ownership. And the state's duty is to protect all wildlife and conserve it for ensuring ecological and environmental security of the country. That's what the judgment says. But you know how one state is behaving. Preservation of an endangered species, which we have to apply, the species best interest standard. Nobody is asking us what should be the best. We should use the lens of the species to figure out what action should be taken. And it also said the order of the ministry to introduce African cheetahs into Kuno cannot stand in the eye of law and same is quashed. Basically meaning it's thrown out. But we are in a stalemate. Um, I'm part of an expert committee that was appointed in July of 2013, which in, unfortunately has not even met since December of 2016. The state government of Gujarat has just been giving excuses. It quotes all kinds of stuff, none of which is tenable. Kuno is ready, 24 villages, 1543 families have moved. They made the sacrifice. The prey base has increased tremendously. So has the management capacity and they've even converted what used to be a wildlife sanctuary to a national park. After 2013 judgment, seeing that nothing was done, another public spirit citizen in 2016 filed a contempt petition. The court started hearing it in late 2017. In March 2018, without any cause, it just dismissed the contempt petition. What I hear is in court that the government said that we will hold a meeting next week. As far as I know, that meeting is still to be held. So from March 2018 to September 22, that meeting is still not being held. Why do we want second, third homes for lions? Because it's like buying life or medical insurance. None of us buy life and medical insurance thinking we will die tomorrow or fall sick tomorrow. It is to have a fallback option if something goes wrong. And there is good evidence to suggest endangered species status will be much better if they exist in multiple populations than a single population. Why? A cyclone can happen, a forest fire can happen, a disease outbreak can happen, a political chaos can happen. One chief minister might suddenly wake up and say, I don't like lions. Right? That, that's possible. So how do you work with that? So you move, and especially for a species which used to live through much of North and Central India. Gujarat has all along said, oh, this all will happen only in Africa because in early 90s, the largest lion population in the world in the Serengeti Mara system, 3,000 lions, faced an outbreak of canine distemper virus. 
and babesiosis. Thousand lions died in three weeks. We don't have a thousand lions. Okay? So when you tell that to Gujarat, they would say, oh, no, it only happens in Africa. You know, we are all special. It never happened here. In 2018, I didn't wish it on the lions, but there was an outbreak of canine distemper virus. As per records, 36. As per otherwise, much more than 36 lions died. Not only did lions die, lions were captured for treatment and vaccination and so on and so forth. And they continue to be in captivity. So this is the great conservation that we are doing. Well, that may be, and, and I showed you more recent numbers about uh, uh, how lions are dying. And in 2020, the court said, on an experimental basis, cheetahs can be brought in. And I will also explain that in a little bit. So that's another complication that the lions are facing now. For me, fundamentally, it's not about ecology. It's not about conservation. It's about India respecting the rule of law. What is the value of a Supreme Court judgment which says, in letter and spirit, translocate lions from Gir to Kono within six months, and even well beyond six years, there is no sign of that happening? It's a question all of us need to ask. The Gujarat government has been throwing IUCN guidelines, IUCN guidelines, and so on and so forth. What does the IUCN say? It recommends studies in a general sense, not as mandatory preconditions for translocation. And it has two parts. One is for a feasibility analysis and the other to guide implementation. Clearly, the court has decided on the feasibility. That's why it said translocated within six months. Nobody is questioning the feasibility. We have to use these guidelines to guide implementation. If these guidelines were not, have not been followed for lions, are you telling me these have been followed for cheetahs? The two coming from Africa? Why are we not asking these questions? Why are we not thinking about these things? So the court was very clear, it's feasible, but implement it using the best available international knowledge and guidelines. So I'm very clear, that's completely wrong, unacceptable on the part of government of Gujarat and to some extent even government of India now to continue to stall and challenge the feasibility of the translocation using the IUC and guidelines only as an excuse. So switching gears, Jayashri, I'm running a little late. I hope that's okay with you. These are African cheetahs. And these are cheetahs in India, archival photographs. So there is no doubt that India had cheetahs. If somebody tells you, as some people have tried to, that lions and cheetahs are never wild in India, that's, that's bunkum. Cheetahs had a very, very wide distribution. I'm not going to spend too much time about it. I'll show you a map so that that tells you they occurred in the thousands. It was not a few dozen animals. So that's a map reconstructed using records. You can see well through much wider than lions, I mean, including in my native district of Tirnelveli. And while the official records say 47, the last cheetah was shot, and 52, they were officially declared extinct, historical research has shown that as late as 1967, there were sightings of cheetahs. Now, we don't know whether they were truly wild cheetahs or something that escaped from somebody's private collection or zoo or something like that, but that's what the records tell us. They occurred, having such a wide distribution, they occur through a diverse set of habitats. And they still, in Africa, occur through a very diverse set of habitats. Not in wet forests, but anything from desert to dry forest and woodland, they are not an animal only found in grassland. That's a wrong conception. We have a remnant population of cheetahs in, in Iran. That's the only Asiatic cheetahs left. It's found in a cold desert system. It's very sparsely vegetated, dry area, highly elevated, hence cold. And what is the population? About 40 with 12 identified individuals. So that's the sum and substance total of what we have left of the Asiatic cheetahs. They occur obviously in very low density, spread over tens of thousands of square kilometers. That is that's the way cheetah operates. And please keep that in mind as we get into this issue. And why did India lose its cheetahs? Basically because cheetahs were captured for using as hunting animals. And it goes back to 1550. So it had a long, nearly five uh, centuries of doing this. So when you keep capturing animals from the wild, males and females, how are they going to reproduce and sustain themselves in the wild? 
already populations were depressed and then the British offered a reward, a bounty to start killing cheetahs in 1871 and that kind of pushed it over the precipice. And of course, prey animals were also depleting and habitat was being taken over. Good cheetah habitat is also good human habitat for agriculture, settlements and so on and so forth. So in that sense, lions and cheetahs suffered the same fate. Some again archival imagery to show you. I mean, you can see a cheetah there and you can see the animals it hunted, black buck. And this is a painting. Um, see how, I mean, it's like a, a typical, even today in rural India, you can go and see these charpoys in these kind of settlements. Of course, you won't see the cats. And look closely, this is another cat called the caracal. Very, very highly endangered. Both of which was trained and used for what is called as coursing. Trained animals let loose to go and hunt, but they will kill them, but they will not eat. Then these uh, uh, field people will go and muzzle the animal, feed it some blood and some meat, and the rest of the meat is taken home. Again, three cheetahs with their handlers. Quick history, 1947, last cheetah shot on record. Official declaration of extinct in 52, 67 is the last creditable report. And in the 60s and 70s, India tried to revive the Asiatic cheetah. Some kind of an exchange program was thought about. We'll give you some lions, can you give us some cheetahs? But then 70s also saw emergency in India and the overthrow of the Shah of Iran, and there, that ended all of that. After that, uh, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in Hyderabad tried to clone Asiatic cheetahs, but Iran refused to give the tissue samples required for that. And then the most recent revival of discussion on cheetahs started in 2009 with a meeting in Gajner in Rajasthan. I've already spoken about the 2012 hearing where I was there and the 2013 order, which is partially appealed. A review petition was filed by the National Tiger Conservation Authority in 2016. And I will quote these things from 2018 and 2020 order to give you a sense of where we are. And of course, this year, the action plan was released in January and now, last Saturday, we have the Namibian cheetahs in Kuno. What is the conservation context here? India's first secretary of the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Professor Kushu, said the reintroduction project was discussed threadbare during Indira Gandhi's tenure and found to be an exercise in futility. If in 1995 it was an exercise in futility, are we trying to tell ourselves that we have much more habitat in 2022 compared to 1995? We had more prey animals in those habitats to be able to support cheetahs. Think, think about it. The justification given is that its name draws its uh, origin in Sanskrit. It's the only large mammal that's gone extinct. If it's so great, why is it not even mentioned in our current National Wildlife Action Plan? Sea of cheetah is not in the National Wildlife Action Plan of 2017 to 2031. The lions are mentioned. The Great Indian Bustards are mentioned, the Caracals are mentioned, Garial is mentioned, a lot more native, resident, critically endangered species are mentioned. No mention of African cheetahs. And if the National Wildlife Action Plan is worth the paper on which it's written, shouldn't it guide our conservation action? I've already mentioned the native species and, and how it doesn't find a place in the National Wildlife Action Plan. I see this attempt to introduce African cheetahs as diversion of attention, diversion of, of financial resources, and an attempt to continue to stall reintroduction of Asiatic lines from Gir to Kuno. The financial estimates for this first five years of cheetah ranges widely. There are multiple documents saying all kinds of figures, but I think the most credible figure is 92 crores over five years. It might not seem so large, but when you compare it with what we normally spend on wildlife conservation, this is a huge fortune. This is way above what we normally invest in wildlife conservation in this country. And that's an example of what otherwise we do to wildlife. We have cut wildlife habitat funding by 47% in three years. And this is a report of March 22, not so long ago. So we, we are cutting funding generally from wildlife conservation. But for African cheetah, we are able to find the money. What is the goal of the cheetah introduction plan? To establish a viable meta population, blah, blah, blah. And to kind of repopulate its historic range. You saw the historic range. Is it even feasible to think and plan along those lines? 
and thereby contributing to global conservation efforts. We had done wonderfully well with all that we are doing in India. So we kind of jump onto the global bandwagon. What is the science behind cheetah ecology? Exists in extremely low densities, less than to one per hundred square kilometers. A comparable number, and this is something you would have even read in the press for leopards in Kuno, is nine per hundred square kilometers. Lions, tigers, leopards normally exist something between six to 12 animals per hundred square kilometers. Cheetah exists around one. What is the area of Kuno National Park? 748 square kilometers. You can do the math. I'm being a little generous. I'm saying it can accommodate a maximum of 10 cheetahs. Is cheetahs a viable population? What do we know more about their ecology? And this is data coming from the best of cheetah habitats from Africa. Average female home range, which is the area it uses in a year, is 760 square kilometers. Home ranges are not territories, they are not defended, but that's the kind of space they need. So for, for a viable cheetah population, you need to be talking in the 5, 10, 15, 20,000 square kilometers of habitat, not in 700s or 1000s and 2000s. The action plan best case scenario is, after introducing at least 50 cheetahs from Africa over the next 5 to 10 years, you will have 21 as an established population in 15 years time. Look at the timelines, look at the numbers. And if with better luck, in 36 years, I mean, sorry, in 30 to 40 years, that 21 can grow to be 36. Does any businessman do business on these numbers? I don't know. Now, that is from the action plan in January. There's been a plethora of news reports, publications in the last few weeks, and this is one from the National Geographic. Look at what one of the main movers of this plan is telling us. We will lose a tremendous amount of animals. We know this. So what do we do? We require a minimum of 500 to 1,000 cheetahs to come from Africa to establish a population in India. And then if it is successfully established, we will manage it heavily, which means you will helicopter one cheetah from here to there. And you know, that's the kind of wild population we are envisaging. It's commonplace in Africa, especially in Southern Africa where bulk of their wildlife exists in fence parks. They don't have 1.4 billion people to deal with. It's not the model for India. And that's when it succeeds. There is no on record success of introduction of cheetahs in unfenced habitats. Not only animals, they're also talking about restoring open forest savanna systems. Now look at this map. This is the map of open forest savanna systems. And this is a map of what is called as wastelands of India. If you do an overlay, what do you think will happen? All these open forest ecosystems will be categorized as wastelands. If you're so serious about conserving this habitat, what will you do? At the very minimum, not declare them wasteland? Does it require an African cheetah to do that? 2016, the NTCA went on a review saying, it's viewed as a blanket ban. Uh, so can you kindly allow us to survey sites other than Kuno? We will not adversely impact line translocation. That was the prayer made to the court. And this is what the Supreme Court said in an interim order in 2018. It may be mentioned that earlier intention was to import African cheetahs to Kuno. By way of this application, the reintroduction of cheetahs from Africa is sought to be made in some other places as mentioned para 3 of the application. What does para 3 read? Pursuant to the above order, which is a 2013 order, efforts have been made to investigate alternate sites for reintroduction of cheetahs into India, such as Nara Dehi in Madhya Pradesh, as well as Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu. This is the prayer made by NTCA in 2016. Now look at where we have landed up. So Kuno was, they said we will avoid Kuno. We will not disrupt line translocation. And another government body advised against introduction of African cheetahs. In, because India does not have required habitat and prey density to support cheetahs, which is still today prevailing. So the 2020, January 2020 order, this is the operative part. Maybe would be introduced in an experimental basis in a carefully chosen habitat, a nurtured watch, whatever, whatever. And if there are difficulties, we will need to explore some other location. But the order also said, go and do your field surveys. Of course, pandemic intervened in all of this. But 
the Royal Life Institute team went out in 2020 for a total of 12 days to assess six sites. Some sites were assessed less than a day. Where was the most time spent? Kuno, which was the site they said they don't even need to survey. Four out of 12 days was spent surveying Kuno. To me, this is a fait accompli. They were telling something to the court. They had some other intention in mind. And they are now going on record saying due to delays in line translocation, Kuno was considered for cheetah interdiction. Why were there delays in line translocation? Who is causing these delays? Should we deal with those delays or bring cheetahs from Africa to resolve the problem? The action plan for cheetah introduction states, once a cheetah population is established in Kuno, reintroduction of the lion or colonization by tigers would not be detrimental for cheetah persistence. In other words, saying, wait for the cheetah to settle down. It might take 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, wherever. Uske baad hum dekhenge. I believe conservation should not be done like this. We cannot afford to act with this level of impunity. But be that, let that be by the side. I think there are some actions that are immediately possible independent of the cheetahs. One such is to abolish this category of wasteland. There's nothing called wasteland. It's human causing waste off land. We can't call land as wasteland. I mean, it's such ecological illiteracy, I can't understand. Because somehow for us, big habitat, I mean, good habitat has to have trees which are 100 feet tall and has to be evergreen. I mean, that, that means all area has to receive 6,000 millimeters of rainfall. Otherwise, you'll not get that kind of habitat. And today, these are the lands which are often given for solar and wind and all kinds of purposes. And that changes land use, causes fragmentation, causes degradation. These are also habitats which support thousands and thousands of our fellow citizens. Nomadic herding populations. Sheep, camel, goats, cattle. They move. And they are seen as a threat. In fact, they are with the least carbon footprint. They don't move around in trucks and buses. They walk their animals. They, they're part of the ecological process. And we already talked about how 21 cheetahs in five years, you saw how widespread the open natural ecosystems are. And we are only introducing cheetahs in Kuno. How can 21 cheetahs in Kuno help us save this tens of thousands of square kilometers across India. So this is all absurd claims, unsubstantiated claims, not supported by data. My question really is, by all means bring cheetahs, do bring hippopotamus, whatever you want to bring. But why Kuno? Kuno has already been ordered by the Supreme Court way back in 2013. And now we see a higher level of impunity. About two months ago, a member of parliament had asked a question to the Minister of Environment and said, can you please educate us? What is the status of lion translocation? We hear it is going to be reintroduced across multiple sites in India. The reply doesn't talk about the 2013 Supreme Court order, doesn't mention K of Kuno, talks only about how lions are finding other habitats within Gujarat, which is your backyard and somebody's front yard. And then subsequent comments in the media. If it regards to cheetah, the minister say, goes on record and says, there is no plan to translocate lions. Are, they, are we asking his permission or are we going by the Supreme Court order? And to kind of, really this is the sting in the tail for me. And this is what Dr. Jala says. He's heard no opposition to the project from Indian politicians or the public. I, I believe we are all members of the public, only from fellow conservationists. The worst enemies for conservation are conservationists, he says. Once it's done and people see the success of it, I think all of them will come around. So please make your voice heard. Now to end on a bit of a personal note, this is how conservation happens in India. This is a leopard jumping from the third floor of an of engineering college in Tumkur. And this is people taking law into their hands. And despite all of this, look at the reverence with which this lady is approaching a dead leopard. And look at the curiosity in the faces of the children around. This is what makes India special. This is what makes conservation possible in India. You go and talk to anybody outside of India, they're just amazed that we are still supporting, conserving, living with large dangerous animals. Almost 50% of most of our endangered species, large mammals, dangerous animals, are outside protected areas. It's because of the tolerance, because of the acceptance that this is possible. Of course, nobody's undermining the role played by the government, played by NGOs, played by people like me, 
But we are not living in those kind of conditions. The local people are living in those conditions. This is my first photograph of a lion, December of 1985. I grew up in Madras, so I'm a Tamil speaking boy. My father, for whatever reason, felt I should learn Hindi in school. God bless him. Because that's what enabled me to serve my first few uh, years there. Because they speak Katiawadi, which is a derivative uh, dialect of Gujarat, Gujarati. And uh, I knew broken Hindi. So 1985, I was selected by the Wildlife Institute of India amongst the first batch of junior research fellows. And those days, they basically said, oh, there are lions in Gujarat, go and study them. That's about bulk of the guidance I got. There was, of course, a project proposal. So I went there to try and get permission to try and set up a field base. December of 85, I was there for four or five days. Every morning, every evening, I would go out, uh, sometimes on vehicle, mostly on foot. I saw their droppings, I saw their tracks, I saw their kill remains, I used to hear them roar. But I had not seen a lion and I was beginning to get very worried. How do you study an animal if you can't see it? This was my last evening. I had a local village boy of about 15 walking with me. And around 5.30, it's Western India, so it's still light. And about 100 meters ahead of me, four lions emerged from the bush. And I was scared. I had never seen, I'd seen once a leopard on foot in Mundundurai when I did my master's research, but the leopard was up on a rock very far away. Here I was at the same level as the lions and these four lions named very intent wanting to attack me. So I kind of looked at him and said, Kya karna? He just did, put his finger on his lip. So I said, okay, I held my breath and kind of stood still. These lions kept coming towards us and I kept looking and he, he didn't seem flustered at all. Then I realized I had a pair of binoculars with me, I had a camera with me and I should kind of try and use them. So by the time I kind of focused and got this picture, the other lions had gone into the bush, but I'm still very proud of this first photo of a lion I took. Took me about six months to do this. This is not trying to be a hero or a Tarzan. It's because when you do long-term studies with animals, you need to identify them. How do you identify a lion? Tiger has stripes, leopard has spots. Lions have no bo body markings. So the only way you can do is to get close up to them, look at their face for cuts in the ear, scars on their face, and what is called as vibrissae spot pattern. In common language, it's whisker spot pattern. The whisker spot patterns are arranged in three or four rows. So it's like our fingerprint, the relative placing of these spots is unique to each animal. So in this kind of habitat, if you're 50 meters away with the most powerful telescope, binoculars, camera, all you will get is a screen of vegetation. So you often have to get 10, 5 meters close to these animals to be able to identify them. Here is a sub-adult radio collared male lion hot summer afternoon, he's sleeping. I crept up to him, this is a wide angle lens, I took the photograph, he heard the shutter go. What is his reaction? Of curiosity, not of aggression. And that's my own shadow. That's a male lion sleeping, this is a negotiated settlement, took me nearly two, three hours to get that close. Don't ask me why I did that, I was young and mad, and not married, so, and this guy's keeping an eye on me. You can see he's still keeping an eye on me. All it tells me is this is an extremely special bunch of lions. I show this to people who study lions in Africa. They really think I'm a certified lunatic. I mean, they say, nobody, uh, where is your gun? I mean, no, who carries a gun in India? I mean, unless it's an elephant habitat. Researchers can't be looking through the sighting scope of a gun. You need to look through binoculars and cameras and do your work. And no lion is asking you to go up that front. It's, it's, it's your own madness that makes that happen. And this is how conservation works. This is not outside, this is inside. A uh, state transport bus, a pair of lions. Daily occurrence. I never tire of talking to people about lions because I don't want this to be the road to extinction, but road to redemption, translocation, and multiple sites of free-ranging population of lions. And gear is not just about animals. It's some, some of the most stunning sunrises, sunsets. I know we live in cities, but I think we should make the time and effort to enjoy the gifts that nature bestows on them. Thank you very much. like to invite uh, Jai Shri Ratnam onto the stage to engage Ravi Chalam in a conversation. Ra Thank you, Ravi, for that extraordinary presentation. So thanks, Ravi. And I think I speak for everyone in the audience here. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, clearly, it's a matter of great, it's very close to your heart. <laughs> and, and you. Uh, spoke to us about um, 
you know, lions versus uh, the cheetah. Asiatic and, uh, lions versus African cheetahs. Yes, okay. Asiatic lions versus African cheetah. And actually you covered so much of ground here today and you've given most of the important points um, you know, that anybody would want to know in terms of the statistics, right, of what's happening and how what really needed to happen was the translocation of lions that didn't happen. Somewhere along the way, those plans have been shelved and we've got the African cheetah, but they're here now. We've got eight cheetahs in Kuno and they're here. And there's a whole, uh, you know, there's a whole machinery around the commitment to continuing, you know, to bring in more cheetahs and to trying to establish this population. So given that, just my question is, going forward, what do you think needs to happen? Cut your losses. You make mistakes, you learn from them. Change tack. What if the Supreme Court now says, why have we not implemented reattraction lines? Right. What do you do then? That obviously has to take precedence. Hmm. That's, that's, a, that's one way of looking at it. That's my way of looking at it. Right. <laughs> But there may be forces that don't work that way. I think a lot of the state machinery and other things have gone into making this happen. And if I were to ask you, let's say we're really, I understand you're really upset the lions ought to have been here. They're in Kuno, they're not. What needs to happen to make the cheetah reintroduction a success? Because you spoke of many ecological reasons why it's not going to be a success. Let's find the habitat which means 5, 10, 15, 20,000 square kilometers of suitable habitat. Because naturally, cheetahs exist in low densities. We can't build multi-storied apartments and ask them to live there. So you need to provide that habitat. The day that habitat is there, I would be at the forefront advocating for cheetah introduction. Okay. And supposing in 10 years from now, Ravi, the lions from Gir were translocated to Kuno, would that go any way to mitigating your deep disappointment at how these events happen? No, I'll happily kick the bucket at then. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a vindication of what I've been saying, but that's not rule of law. Yes. So I don't want to give up my faith in rule of law. Right. I agree. But I do want to point out, Ravi, that even within the conservation community, right, opinions around... Uh, this reintroduction have been... Introduction, please. Introduction have been divided, right? And there are some people who do think that, um, you know, this introduction may go some way towards raising the profile of, um, you know, the need to conserve grassland and savanna ecosystems. And the reason I bring this up, Ravi, is that I am a community and plant ecologist, and for the past... Uh, decade, I have spent uh, my research, my research uh, has looked at all the reasons why we should be recognizing grasslands and savannas for the important and unique biomes that they are. We need to conserve them. Me and several other colleagues here in the country and across the globe, not so much from Africa, but uh, this sort of blindness towards the grassland and savanna biome is something that's global. You know, my colleagues in South America talk about it. It's, it's better for Africa, but elsewhere on the globe, savannas and grasslands have been greatly ignored. Several of us have been, uh, you know, we've been doing research, we've been publishing papers, we've been talking about how, you know, there needs to be more attention on this biome. They need, it needs to get conserved. But actually, we are unable to get the ear of policymakers. I, I would say that 50 papers down the road, not mine, uh, across the community, many colleagues, we haven't really managed to get savanna and grassland ecosystems the attention they deserve. And that's because at the end of the day, conservation is really incredibly emotive. And almost every time you hear of a su conservation success story, it doesn't come because it was ecologically correct or made sense, but it's because it's somehow driven by emotion. And in that context, the reintroduction 
of the cheetah, no matter, it's not the Asi Asiatic cheetah, it's the cousin of the cheetah. It's a very powerful emotive symbol. You know, here was this animal, we lost it, it went from the subcontinent, primarily due to our own depredations of the habitat, because we hunted it, we exterminated it. We are making good, we are trying to right a wrong, and in the process, here's this magnificent, beautiful creature. Granted, it's not the same, but you know, genetically it's 99 point so much percent, it's pretty close. We're bringing it back, and in the process of all this pageantry and imagery around this, I am wondering if this will not raise the profile of grasslands and savannas more than 10 years of work that me and several colleagues have been doing across the globe. So there is one part of me that say that wants to uh, that that thinks that a very small part that uh, you know maybe if at the end of the day this introduction ends up not for ecological reasons, but for emotive reasons, bringing the savanna into the light, bringing it into people's consciousness and making people realize that these are beautiful biomes and we've been ignoring them. And because of that, not directly because the cheetah plays a critical role in the grassland habitat or any such thing, but because now it's on everybody's consciousness, more money and more efforts go into conserving different savanna and grassland habitats across India. Would it have been worth it? That's my question. I know that in conservation, we always say we have to be an optimist. But optimism also should know its bound, should have its foundation in realism. As long as these biomes are categorized in the wasteland atlas, they will be only treated as wastelands, cheetah or no cheetah. It's not as if these biomes lack in native, resident, critically endangered, highly charismatic species. In what way does the lion, caracal, black bug, great Indian bustard, lesser florican, chinkara, I could go on, lack in charisma compared to the African cheetah? Would it not be a much more effective, efficient way of conserving? It's not that these animals don't figure in our myths, in our folklore, in our traditions. Which animal figures in the emblem of India? So you can tell me stories. I will listen to you patiently, but I don't have to believe you. And in response to an earlier thing about powerful political forces, who gives power to the politicians? We the people. So it's for we the people to decide what is correct. I will keep advocating as long as I have the energy and the will. Thanks, Ravi. Um, should we throw it open to the to Q and A now? Okay. So those which I just wanted to make some of the points, you know, from the other side, uh, as well as, you know, I, I think the important argument of the emotive power in conservation. And um, with that, I think we should throw it open to the audience because I think we're... Uh, thank you for that scintillating talk, Ravi. I don't know if you remember me. You and I were both young men in 1987. <laughs> I was a professor at I am Ahmedabad and you Raghu. and my wife, Meena. Raghu, Raghu, Raghu. Lock yes, man. I'm Raghu. Lock man. We both went to Gair on foot. We were surrounded by four lions and my first lesson in what to do when you're faced with lions. He was a man of very few words then, as he is now, as you could see from some of his answers. You know, we turn a bush and there was this enormous lion sitting there and he tells me, Raghu, no matter what happens, don't turn your back. That was my only lesson and I listened to him. And then we were accompanied by three lionesses which came because they heard the growling of the lion. And those 20 minutes, I still remember, and then the same day, if you recall, we walked up river pathway because there were two cubs that you wanted to track. And as they ran up the hill, you said the lioness may attack any moment now. And sure enough, the lioness ran after us and we ran like crazy. And then you immediately stopped. And then I asked him, why did you run now? He said, look, in the morning, the lion was 10 feet away and it could jump over all over you if you turned your back. But here, 
as the cubs are going uphill and they know the lioness knows that they have been spotted she would charge and she only wants to put distance between us and the cubs so running a few you know tens of meters is good enough so this young man in those days without a gun not only did he survive he made me survive along with him that one day thank you very much welcome nice to see you ravi thanks for coming <laughs> should be the story for almost everybody here <laughs> hi ravi hi arjun thank you uh we spoke up you know heard a lot about uh, you know lions and the biomes that they live in the cheetahs that are coming in but what about the people who live there right what role do they play in this entire conservation system because more often than not right even when you look at these webinars that happen in you know at various organizations these institutes and all of that we always hear experts coming up and having a talk and having a talk within the between each other we never get the community voice out so what role do they have to play are you talking center? about gear or kuno or I'm both i'm just talking about conservation oh um that's why i talked about what is conservation who bears the cost who reaps the benefits I mean, we didn't have the time to discuss. Clearly, it's local communities who bear the costs. Clearly, it's people like us who reap the benefit. Be it researchers, be it just citizens of this country, be it tourists, especially. It's it's a somewhat crazy situation where we say for conservation, people have to be moved out, but we will allow tourists to come in. For somebody. whose daily existence depends on having access to resources they are seen as a threat but somebody which who obviously has a huge carbon footprint compared to the people living there it's okay to get them in it's how governance works and these are questions we really need to be asking not in this forum i mean i'm happy to answer but much more deeply and widely of our lawmakers okay. just one second arjun sorry today we have the forest rights act this bestows right constitutionally to forest dwellers but the forest department has from day 1 been negatively disposed towards this act because one it's an act of the ministry of tribal affairs it's not their ministry's act and two they see this as disempowering for them as as the bureaucrat i think we again as much as i like all of you to advocate for land translocation need to be advocating for much more effective and efficient implementation of the forest rights act when people get rights they get empowered they can then lead much more dignified lives so when you had this conversation in 95 with you know with the with the government official and conservationists about relocating or you know having another location for the lions when such kind of discussions happen how much of the local communities are involved in that discussion are they involved at all at least in my case very little there were conversations but the important thing was we increased the financial allocation tenfold for each family at that point of time we also redefined a family anybody over 18 years old was treated as a family unit so at least from a financial allocation perspective there was i mean that was revolutionary in those days thank you thank you yeah i had uh, one question so given that cheetahs have been given uh, priority in kuno does that set back asiatic lion conservation efforts by many years and uh, additionally are there other sites that have been identified for translocation of the lions good question first i'll answer the second part yeah. i did my research from december 85 to march of 90 my field work and took my time finishing up my thesis so by 93 i had bulk of the data in place and so on so that in, gave me an information as to what we should look for in choosing a site for translocation there's a process called habitat p i hab, know uh, population habitat viability analysis mm. and that was held in baroda in 93 in middle of 93 and prior to that we wrote out letters to all the former states chief wildlife wardens 
saying, can you please suggest sites? And these are the criteria. Should be at least 800 square kilometers, should have this kind of prey population, should be relatively undisturbed by people. So they gave some nomination, some of which was less than 800 uh, square kilometers. So in this PHVA, we put all this data and identified three potential sites. Right. Kuno in Madhya Pradesh, Sita Mata in Udaipur district of Rajasthan, and Dara Jawar Sagar, which is two parks, uh, which is in Kota district of uh, Rajasthan. Right. These three sites were surveyed across a 12 month cycle in 93 and 94. And at the end of 94, we prepared the report and presented this in January 95 to the ministry. So we have looked at three sites. The Rajavar Sagar is a very narrow park with only 10 kilometer being the average width. So you drop a line even in the center, in one night it's going to go out. So yeah. that's not an ideal situation. In Sita Mata, after weeks of surveying, we saw one four-horned antelope. So clearly lines yeah. cannot be brought there. Kuno in that sense. It's a large forest tract, had diverse prey, which is why it was chosen. So right now, there are no other sites under consideration for lions. Getting to your first part of the question, there is no doubt. And I think it also came up in the conversation I presented it. This is not an attempt to introduce cheetahs. This is not an attempt to conserve open natural forest ecosystems. This is only an attempt to stall, and hopefully for them, prevent translocation of lions. So will it have a negative impact? I think I've given you the answer. Yeah. Thank you. We have to ask these questions. I mean, we can't, I am not able to sleep. How is this, that's why I say it's a rule of law issue. It's not about ecology. It's not about conservation. It's not about lions. It's not about cheetahs. It's about rule of law. As Indian society, what respect do we have for rule of law? Of course, we don't stop at red lights. That's a different matter. We drive on pavements, all of that. But this is a bigger question we have to ask. What is the value of the Supreme Court judgment if it's disregarded to this extent? Their prayer in 2016 intervention review petition said, we will not survey Kono. We will not affect line translocation. What is the result? I, I just want to go back to what, uh, sorry, uh, Jayashri Jai said. You know, the cheetahs have arrived, it's a reality, okay? So um, let's see to what extent, um, you know, we can examine possibilities to, um, you know, in terms of going forward and all this that has come out. Um, first of all, um, are the cheetahs and, the, I mean, is there still hope for the lions to go to Kuno? Subject to the fact that you can also look at some alternative locations for these cheetahs that are, you know, on the way as it were. I mean, is that possible? See, because you did say somewhere in your speech that in Africa or wherever, uh, the, the, the cheetahs survive in, in multiple locations, right? So it's not, it's not that... Uh, no, cheetahs live through much of southern, eastern, parts yeah. of western and even northern Africa. Yeah, and even if you look at the, the map that you showed us, they were all over India. Yes. So if you can kind of stop them on their tracks now and sort of say, all right, we can still, there's still hope for the lions if they can coexist with these eight fellows who have already come and let loose in Kuno. Uh, can't you look at some alternative sites? Given the research that was done for Kuno for the cheetahs, I'm sure that much No, no, that's the question I'm having. I had a slide also which said, why Kuno, no? My question is, why? And I, in answer to that gentleman's question, I, I, a question I've answered that. The Kuno is not about cheetahs, it's not about conservation. Mm. So whatever logic, science you bring to the table, who wants to listen to you? And by the way, South Africa has still not signed the MOU with India. So where was the tearing hurry? You don't even have the MOU in place. Okay. No, what I'm saying is in terms of going forward and taking the next steps, since the arrival is a fait accompli now, so hey, continue to sort of press for the lions, bring them into Kuno, and then look, in the next batch, you say they'll go to, Sat the cheetahs can Jaga go to hai. Satya Mangalam or wherever. Jaga nahi hai. Sorry? There's no space. See, that's my question. Finding the habitat, preparing the habitat, connecting the habitat, rebuilding prey is unglamorous, painstaking, backbreaking, long-term work. That should have been done 10, 15 years ago 
and then we would have been happily with cheetahs, lions, leopards, tigers, all in the same mix. We've not done that. Because I'm just looking at the kind of short spell of diligence done for the cheetah. That same short, short duration diligence can be looked at for another habitat. That was my no, suggestion. No, but they have located, they had a short list of eight habitats. Kuno is the best habitat. None of them is even ready. The action plan doesn't even talk about the other habitats now. I'm just looking at a constructive way. No, no, no. I'm, not, I'm <laughs> sorry if I'm coming across as negative. No, you're not negative. I'm just saying given what's happened, we need to think ahead and stop further damage. That's all. Speak up. Speak up. In continuation with what uh, you just said, if I can just add a couple of comments here. Again, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate to some extent. But, you know, in terms, in our country, most of the megafauna is outside the protected areas, right? And so India is actually this unique place in the world where people live at very high densities, coexisting with dangerous animals, right? This includes tigers, leopards, and now lions, which are all over, you know, outside gear, etc. In that context, when I think about the cheetah, cheetahs actually are much less likely to attack humans than are lions or tigers. And as you know, the history of the cheetah is that because it was more docile, it was heavily domesticated and, you know, it became practically domesticated. So to the, to the extent that that is true, Ecologically, it's actually easier for humans to coexist in spaces with cheetahs than it is to coexist with lions and tigers, which are actually more likely to lead to human, uh, to the loss of human lives. So if you were to take that argument, and then we were to say, look, historically, the cheetah really existed pretty much right across the country. And if we were to look at all these Ma you know, uh, predators like lions and as well as tigers across the country. What we know is the reality today is that much of their diet is subsidized by livestock. Actually, the most densely populated animals across the subcontinent are domestic livestock. They are everywhere. Between our cattle, goat, sheep, etc. They are right across the landscape. In other words, if you were to get away with the, from the framework of the protected area with wild prey, in fact, there is prey that can subsidize a number of predators across much of the subcontinent. And in fact, this is true. If you look at studies of diet analyses of tigers, there's a lot of uh, cattle in there. There's livestock in there. If you look at leopards, tons of dogs. So, in some sense, if you were to take that ecology and just fast forward, thinking about a country, uh, uh, think about India, where just like the wolf, the cheetah also roams the semi-arid and arid lands, and it shares them with pastoralists, and therefore domestic livestock become a large part of the prey. If you think about it in that way, it may not be inconceivable to think about cheetahs, you know, and other, uh, you know, uh, um, predators actually persisting in these landscapes. But it needs us to do two things. It gets away from the protected area framework. It actually talks about a new and completely revolutionary idea that we're actually going to build landscapes where people coexist. It's something we've done historically, but we want to do it in a more formal way now. And the critical thing there would be to ensure that people who suffer losses from these animals are adequately compensated. So when a cheetah takes your livestock, compensation must be swift. It must, be, it must actually make up for your loss. Or when a wolf takes away your sheep, it has to be quick. Supposing we could do that and find ways to minimize um, sort of like negative interactions, is it possible for us to imagine a very different framework of conservation where across large parts of rural India, where populations may be at least you know, less dense than in urban areas, there may be possibilities to think about conservation of all these magnificent wildlife, not inside protected areas, but perhaps outside. But in ways, I mean, I'm just saying this because it may sound, it's already a reality. It's already happening in many parts of the country. Can we put frameworks 
and official legislation in place that actually protects people and compensates them when losses happen. And if we were to put that in place, can we then imagine a different kind of conservation? It's, as you rightly said, it's already happening by default. It's not as if, it's, in some sense, it's good it's happening by default because when you formalize things, the spirit is lost. It then becomes form-filling. But I think we need to explore this idea. This idea is definitely worth pursuing. But in the cheetah's case, unfortunately, it might not be ideal. But given its ecology, because, given its fragility, a pack of feral dogs is death sentence for the cheetah. So in human-dominated habitats, while an elephant can survive, a lion can survive, a leopard can survive, it's going to be extremely difficult for cheetahs to survive. I think, I think that's a correct point. Uh, but I keep going back to the idea that when we look at the history of the cheetah in India, and if you read this, uh, for all of you, you should read this fantastic paper by Ranjit Singh and uh, Raza Kazmi, 2019, the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. They put, they've put together decades of work uh, of cheetah records from across the country for over like hundreds, a couple of hundred years. And what is really, really striking about the cheetah going away from the subcontinent is that most of it was because we hunted it out yeah, of existence. Absolutely. Hunting was the capture, primary... Capture. Don't forget. Yeah. First capture. Capture and hunting were the primary reasons the cheetah went. I know people are talking about habitat loss, but I actually think it comes below. So supposing we don't hunt them anymore and supposing they are there, this is the view of the conservation optimist. And I think maybe it's possible. No, you know, the, and with cheetahs, the, as long given as their low density, the, yes. my problem is given the low density and Agreed. their relative fragility compared to leopards and lions and tigers right. in, in coping with human dominated habitat. And actually, I have a technical question about that. Cheetahs in their prime in the subcontinent, numbered in the thousands, yep. suggesting to me that at some point on the subcontinent, they actually existed at far greater densities than they do in Africa. Not really. Not really. Is that... Is India my is a large country. Wrong? India is a large country. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Rana? Oh. Oh, Ramesh. Uh, hi, Ravi. I'm back to Bangalore now. <laughs> Pondicherry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, really, you know, thank you for inviting me for this your wonderful talk about this uh, lion and cheetah. Uh, okay, you mentioned a lot of actors in India, from India. But what about these international actors like uh, uh, Chita Conservation Fund and all? What is their role? You know, how... Well, requirement? there's actually an interesting yeah. paper published last year, mm. which says that in Namibia, mm. it doesn't mention agencies, it doesn't mention individuals. They have cried wolf, wolf. Cheetahs are going extinct. And it seems to be an attempt at raising money. Mm. Individual conservation agencies have raised upwards of $3 million in a year. Mm -hmm. Because in Namibia, cheetahs are not going extinct. They're actually surplusing population in Namibia. Mm -hmm. So this, to me, might be an attempt at increasing their legitimacy that not only are we conserving cheetahs in Namibia and South Africa, we are extending our arms 9,000 kilometers away into India. Clearly, look at the media tamasha that's going on. And that puts them in the limelight, gives them a leg up. It's, it's their time in limelight, is the way I see it. And it's increasingly frustrating to hear them and other South Africans advising India how we should conserve our nature, when actually we've done a bloody good job of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is, you know, okay, you are talking about this... Uh, Savanna, wastelands, and all these things. But uh, as you know, that the French Institute has done a lot of work on uh, vegetation mapping and all these things. Uh, actually, compared to whatever we have, you know, in uh, Africa, we don't have any true savannas. So in India, uh, in fact, what we call as you know, it's kind of a degraded formations, okay, uh, because of uh, regular fire and uh, there are other uh, biotic pressures. Now we see grasses and also the sparse trees and bushes here and there. Uh, so do you think now they, the habitat they have chosen, whatever may be the size, uh, is it ideal for uh, cheetah conservation? Cheetah lives, as I said, across mm. a wide variety of habitats mm. from fairly dense woodland mm. to deserts. Okay. 
So from a habitat structure point of view, I do not have a problem. It's okay. primarily size, prey density. As far as Savannah is concerned, mm. I leave it to the expert to answer. <laughs> okay. uh, Dr. Ramesh, yeah. I, I disagree that all the savannas of Asia are degraded habitats. No, no, not Asia. I mean, I, oh, South Asia. Yeah. So we have, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence mm. at this point, both paleoecological as well as uh, looking up from the functional traits of the plants that we find in savanna habitats. And also some recent work showing that actually, if you look in the understories of these habitats, not so much at the trees, but mm. in the grassy and foam layer, yes, yes, yes. massive surge in the reporting of endemics. You don't get endemic species in habitats that have come, out, come about by degra degradation in the past 200 years. There is a lot of evidence gathering mm -hmm. that suggests that these are actually pretty ancient habitats. Not all of them, of course, because the fingerprint of human presence in the subcontinent is so old. Mm -hmm. Today on the subcontinent, ancient original savannas as well as degraded savannas are probably in a mosaic, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely that we definitely had, uh, you know, savanna habitats and uh, grassy Maybe habitats. Maybe not like the Serengeti Mara expansive one, but in patches. Uh, yes, all through. yes. Because whenever yes. we look at cheetah, always, you know, they gave a picture of a cheetah running at 100 kilometers. No, no, no. So it is not possible. <laughs> it's, it, it's also lions from East Africa, you know, Serengeti Mara. That's what the television yes, will yes, tell yes, you. Yes, yes. The reality is different. Reality is different. I know that they also uh, live uh, in, uh, among the bushes. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Mish. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, Jayashri. Uh, two comments. Uh, I came down to speak about, just I wanted to make one comment, but now I have a second comment, which was in response to the conversation you just had. You know, there are various other dimensions to human wildlife relationships. And of course, you pointed out being, being the devil here. Uh, that there could be ways in which we could conceive. We, of course, don't have a choice, right? Yeah. We are looking at coexistence. Yeah. How and who does the coexistence is the question. And, you know, it's a very complex issue. I remember meeting an individual from Namdafa who said, and I'll say it in Hindi and then I'll translate it. So there's one tiger in Namdafa. And that's the source of all my difficulties. If it should die, we will live. And I fear for the cheetah, whether it kills livestock or not, at some point people will realize that, and we know that, that they will be translocated, they'll be moved away, they'll be held responsible even if a cheetah dies. And if there's some thought that it may have been a domestic dog or some poisoning or whatever, so I fear for the people and I fear for the cheetah. But the second comment I had was about the cheetah. Nobody's talking about it. Of course, at one end of the spectrum is about its rights its, and our obligations to the individual cheetahs that we bring. But more importantly, nobody's talking about the ecology. The, these cheetahs come from a population that has never hunted the Indian herbivores, right? Have we thought about whether it will survive feeding on what exists there. And we are talking, of course, you, you mentioned the home range and how much of ranging it needs to do. But what about the food? What about the other aspects of the ecosystem, both abiotic and biotic, that it has never seen in its evolutionary history? So uh, do we have even the thought that will it, how long will they survive even if left alone? Nobody's talking about it. No, they are. I mean, you heard about Vincent now talking, we will need 500 to 1,000 cheetahs. What does that tell you? We're going to lose a lot of animals. I've, I've, I've questioned the fact that these animals will not have even a search image for a deer. Exactly. Uh, but I've also talked to cheetah experts. They think it might not be such a problem, but it's something that we need to wait and watch. Yeah. And today, Bishnoi is a written to either the chief minister or prime minister, I forget, and saying it's cruel to crawl cheetal because they've trucked cheetal from two other places and put them in this five square kilometers subdivided into nine or 10 compartments, which means half a square kilometer, to enable the cheetah to learn to hunt deer. In half a square kilometer, what I can hunt cheetal, yeah? Forget <laughs> cheetahs. 
And what about the leopards that were removed? The leopard. See, that was. I don't have a problem. I have a problem when South Africans suggest when other predators are managed. What does that mean? Capture and remove or kill. That is where I have a problem. Absolutely. These leopards were removed from within the enclosure, which is correct. I mean, you leave a cheetah and a leopard. Do I need to tell you what will happen? Which effectively means, as someone was asking, we can't bring the lions into Kuno anymore, right? Not really. Leopards, I mean, leopards, lions, cheetahs live together. They have their unique adaptations. Leopard primarily because of its arboreal, cheetah because of its low density. There will be, I mean, if a lion meets a leopard, end of story for leopard. If a leopard meets a cheetah, end of story for cheetah. That's the way of life. I've seen lions kill and eat leopards. Sure. But do you, do you see that happening in Kuno? What? As compared to Africa? What happening? Uh, the lion and the cheetah and the leopard coexisting. In I Kuno. don't know about the cheetah. I mean, I have very little hope for the cheetahs to survive. Mm -hmm. In 740 square kilometers, what cheetah? What's a That's glorified right. safari park? <coughs> Wild population, Bhagawan Jane. Uh, Rana, thanks for that about bringing up the point about we aren't thinking about what is happening to these individuals Absolutely. and the amount of stress they're going through. Absolutely. And that again is another very uh, sort of divisive sort of line in the, con in the conservation community and con conservation conversation about, yeah, you know, there. yeah, it about, you know, compassion yep. versus, you know, sacrificing these individuals for some. Um, Probably nebulous goal. Collateral yeah. damage. <laughs> yeah, my name is Murli Dar Rao. Uh, Jayashri. Okay. Uh, Jayashri talked about uh, cheetahs possibly surviving on cattle. Now, UP has a serious problem of stray cattle. Um, maybe let loose of cheetahs there. No, I'm talking about places like Bundelkhand which is more like... Yeah, uh, Jansi, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But these cattle will even defend themselves against tigers and lions. They are big, bold. They are some piece of work. No cheetah will stand a chance against these cattle. These are, I mean, if, if there are calves, maybe a, a, a cheetah can get it. But the other feral cattle, human beings run away from them. There's no question of cheetahs being able to hunt those cattle. Cattle also know how to defend themselves. Well, time has been called. Thank you very much for your patient engagement.